<laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Levinson. This is a special episode of Light On, Light Through, usually just an audio podcast, but we're going to have video as well. And the reason why we're doing this special episode is the foundation series, the first season of it on Apple TV Plus just ended a couple of days ago. So I've asked two experts in the series, that is, they didn't make the series, but they've been watching it and reviewing it and talking about it to join me in this conversation. First, Cora Boulert, I think we met, I don't know, about three or four years ago on Kindle boards. This is like one of these uh, boards that's available for people who love Kindle books. Cora has been doing all kinds of exciting things. Every week she posts a list of speculative fiction links with all kinds of great URLs to reviews and commentaries about science fiction. She also does that with uh, detective stories. And in addition to that, in her copious free time, she writes reviews of each Foundation episodes that, that are almost as long as one of Asimov's stories uh, in that uh, wonderful series. Uh, I've known Joel McKinnon for a much shorter period of time. I noticed his podcast, Selden Crisis, just a few months ago. It's a wonderful podcast in which Joel not only talks about each of Isaac Asimov's foundation stories in sequence, but a real treat, Joel actually enacts the story uh, by literally doing what in effect is a radio play of each story. And uh, trust me, it's really wonderful. It's a great way to get into the stories if you don't know them already. And uh, it also is just great to listen to uh, if you already have uh, read the stories, which I assume most people on planet Earth have, but who knows. All right, let's uh, begin uh, with uh, talking about the series. And uh, I'll just say a couple of words about what I thought about it. And then maybe Cora and Joel can say a couple of words and then we'll get into some of the uh, more specific aspects. Uh, in a few words, uh, I'm almost like schizophrenic about the Foundation series, because the part of it that was closest to Isaac Asimov's writings, which have been my favorite science fiction since I read it back in the 1950s and continues to be, I have mixed feelings about that. I thought some parts worked, some parts irritated me, some parts infuriated me. But there was a totally separate from Asimov's original story aspect to the television series. And these were the clones, the three clones who form the emperor in the series referred to also as empire. And this was something that Asimov didn't deal with at all. And I think the television series did a magnificent job in dealing with that. So let's... Uh, hear what Cora and Joe briefly think of the overall series. Um, well, my, my impressions were similar to yours. I also loved the books for a long time. I read, I read them at, in my late teens. Um, I, found, um, I found Prelude to Foundation, which had just been, been newly published at Essence Airport, where I was stuck in, after during a stopover back in 1989. And I didn't mind the stopover on a on an airport with a non-functional air conditioning system after that anymore, because the book was so good. And then I read all of them and I've loved them for a long time. And um, it was a serious, um, I also have mixed feelings. Parts of it are very, very good. Not necessarily, the actors are almost all good, especially Jared Harris as, um, as uh, Harry Seldon, who's pretty much, who is pretty much seems to have been born to play Harry Seldon. And um, of course, um, the three emperors, the three clone emperors are all good, uh, good. And um, Laura Byrne, who plays uh, Demerzel, is um, the character he plays is male in the books, but it doesn't really matter because they are a robot anyway. And uh, she's actually, she was, I was skeptical initially, but she was is very, very good. 
but uh, and the whole thing looks gorgeous, wonderful uh, designs, wonderful special effects. Uh, the Clone Emperor saga is very compelling, even though it has nothing whatsoever to do with the books. Uh, the stuff which actually comes from the books, I have mixed feelings about. Again, some of it is good, good. Some of it is uh, not so good. Some of it simply completely misses the what I think is the spirit and the point of the books. All right. Thank you. Joel? Well, uh, yeah, I agree with everything you guys have said. And I just want to say that for me, it... Sat, it satisfied the main criteria for me it was entertaining it was really entertaining uh, and i love the books absolutely you know obviously doing selden crisis i've been doing a really close reading of the trilogy so far uh, and it's so different but it's still very satisfying to watch and i uh, I think very early when I first started watching the trailers and there was all this brothers, brother day, brother dusk, brother dawn nonsense, I thought, okay, this is not going to be the books. Uh, and so I think maybe accepting that really early helped me to, to uh, embrace the TV show as it is. Uh, it's, uh, there's some really interesting ideas. Oh, back to the entertaining aspect. The main thing that makes me realize that it was very entertaining is I looked forward to Thursday night, like for the last 10 weeks and you know, I couldn't wait to watch it. And I never went more than maybe an hour, you know, past when it was available before I watched it and just ate it up. And most of them I've watched twice. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty good. Uh, and visually, especially, it's just knockout beautiful. Uh, Trantor is just gorgeous, and it looks like Trantor that I imagined, except that it's not enclosed. Uh, but they explained that um, as you know, a simulation of the sky. Um, the the Star Bridge was fantastic. I thought that was a really cool addition. Uh, obviously, an, a technological update. Um, and uh, they, I want to talk real briefly about the imbalance that you guys noticed. Uh, you know which I did too, uh, the Empire side of the story seems to be really, really well thought out and beautifully written, beautifully acted, uh, at, you know, really compelling plot lines. And the Terminus side of the story especially uh, seems to be kind of uh, almost uh, rushed into place, it seems, in some places, uh, kind of not given as much depth of thought uh, and I have a wild theory on that. I don't know if you want to get to that yet. Um, Tell us briefly. Okay. Well, there's a, uh, there's a Reddit theory out there that, that it has something to do with the creative differences that uh, Josh Friedman left early with and they, their theory um, and many of these Asimov experts, on Reddit uh, just hate the series because it's not pure like the books. And they're they're raging at Goyer, the showrunner, right, for, for everything that's done wrong. Uh, and they can't say that the creative differences were that Goyer's were, you know, anything credit to Goyer. So um, what they've decided is that Josh Friedman came up with the Empire story and Goyer's is all the other crap. Right. <laughs> and my interpretation of it is the opposite. It, it makes more sense to me uh, from listening to Goyer and reading a lot of what he's done in interviews and things. He loves the Empire side of the story and he, he's always talking about it. And it's where his heart seems to be. So if anything, it seems to me that it was the other way around, that the creative difference might have been Josh Friedman saying, you know, we the heart of the story is foundation, and that's where you should put be putting the emphasis. And that wasn't happening. So, anyway, that's my theory. That's a good a good theory. Let me just say a couple of things about uh, what we've just been talking about. One, there was a literary critic who came out with a lot of books in the 1920s in England. His name was I. A. Richards. I think Ivor Armstrong Richards. He wrote a book called Practical Criticism, another book called Literary Criticism. The reason why I'm mentioning him is one of the fundamental principles in Richard's approach to literature, which 
of course could apply to movies and television series is that you should never pay attention to what the creator says that the creator is an unreliable <laughs> witness even if the creator is being honest the creator may not be aware of the unconscious things that came into the creator's work and all too often the creator is not honest. And I remember even, you know, when the Sopranos ended with that, you know, wild ending and people saying, what did David Chase really mean? You know, uh, it doesn't matter what David Chase really meant. And David Chase himself has changed his explanation of what that ending meant now about two or three times. So I just wanted to make that general principle point. The other point has to do with something I've noticed over the years, uh, and I call it the first love syndrome. And, and what it means is I found that whenever there's an adaptation of something, wh what people tend to love is what they have first experienced. And I, I noticed this, I was at a science fiction convention, I guess oh, way back in the 1990s, and I was on a panel talking about Star Trek. And we were talking about, you know, the Star Trek, the Star Trek movies. Uh, that's okay. That's, that's a good special effect there, uh, Joe. <laughs> we were talking about the Star Trek uh, movies and, you know, the Star Trek original series. And somebody in the audience raised his hand and he said, I, 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 you, my favorite Star Trek is Star Trek, the motion picture. This was the first motion picture that was made of Star Trek. It's generally recognized as a complete disaster. I mean, all that was good about it, right? But uh, the, and, and it was then that I, and so I said, really? I mean, so you, uh, let me understand this. You saw the television series that was made in the 60s and, 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 uh, and then you went out to see the movie and you liked the movie better than the television <laughs> series? And he said, no, it was the other way around. I, I never saw the television series. He was a relatively young guy. The movie was my first experience. And I, uh, you know, loved the movie. And somehow the television series didn't just measure up to it. So I think that what the clone story uh, in the Foundation television series did is it got Foundation out of that first love syndrome. In other words, it provided an avenue for people to really come into the story and love it without comparing it uh, you know, to Asimov's work. And uh, because I honestly can't imagine anyone if the series on television were just Terminus and just Harry Seldon and just, you know, Gail, uh, and, you know, there was some good changes. I thought it was great that Gail was a woman rather than some boring guy mathematician. But if it was just that, I think the uh, series would have been much less successful. Uh, but listen, let's let's look at some of these specific uh, things and some of the specific points improved or not improved. Uh, let's start with a relatively non-controversial uh, point. Uh, and I know that uh, Cor has written a, a little bit about this. I've, uh, in my reviews, expressed in general my displeasure with Demersal in the television series until the last episode where she was spectacular and the next to the last episode she was pretty good as well uh but the reason why i didn't particularly like it is in asimov's work and, and obviously uh demersal represents the fusion of asimov's robot stories and his foundation stories but asimov took much more care in showing how the robot struggled often to make decisions, you know, weighing the three laws and so on. Uh, so I would view Demersal as a success in the television series at the end, but not a particularly good, vibrant, exciting character up until those last two episodes. What do you think? Um, uh, oh, 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 you go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say, um, I think part of it is uh, they didn't have the rights to the robot series. So there is a lot of the real background that goes into who Demersal was in the books that they couldn't cover. Uh, the, the background of it, the foundation of it, you know, the three laws, because there's no 
there's very little mention of the three laws in foundation, even in the prequels or the sequels. It's they talk a lot about the zeroth law, but very little on the on the three laws. So I, I think there may have been uh, a, a limitation on how much they could talk about the three laws, uh, and but they definitely could talk about or represent the zeroth law because that was uh, introduced. Uh, well, I guess it was introduced in the robot series, but it it was definitely emphasized in Foundation as well. And the Robots of Dawn, I think, is the one with the uh, with the uh, zeroth law. Yeah, one of the ones which came out in the nineteen eighties. That's right. Yeah, it really was. Um, it really came out in uh, Robots and Empire, um, where he really ah, oh, kind of solidified oh, yes. the concepts. Was another one. Yeah. Yes, another one of the eighties. Um, they were all already in place. The only one which was published after I started reading the series, so I could really read the whole thing in order. The only ones that came after was Forward the Foundation, which I read after I'd read the others. But the summer a little different situation because the 1980s sequels had already been published by the time I discovered the series. Anyway, I liked the actress Laura Byrne a lot. I was originally a bit skeptical because um, Demerzel or Daniel as... Um, he, she is called in the books, is a very iconic character character, and uh, is male in the books. But on the, on the other side, he, she, he or she or they are a robot, so it really doesn't matter. I mean, we've seen Demazel rip off her face, uh, her face, she can put on a different one. It, well, her gender doesn't matter at all. And the actress does a fine job, um, job being at once very robotic and synthetic and also, well, showing emotions. Motions. What I didn't like was, okay, they can't mention the three laws of robotics, no problem, but maybe the Mazel should follow them. She can't, killing people is, the first law of robotics is a robot may not harm a human. And the Mazel harms humans. We see her early on, overseeing the torture of a suspected terrorist sympathizer, okay, maybe that would still work because um, those terrorists are awful people that could that could work with the zero's law. The zero's law means a robot has to protect humanity. And so, yeah, those, kill, those terrorists killed 150 million people. So yeah, she has every, so, okay, I don't, don't really have many issues with her torturing. Oh, she's not actually torturing, yeah. she's just standing by while someone else is torturing the terrorist sympathizer. But um, she kills two people in the course of the series. First, uh, Sefer Halima, this um, priestess from this, um, from this weird um, subplot I didn't like at all, this religion subplot, especially since it went on to for way too long about um, religious schism in a, in a kind of important religion in the empire, because um, the books don't pay a lot of attention to religion and have a very, very cynical view of religion. And uh, the series took it all very seriously. It's, oh, it's, and um, made, and pretended this religion, which we've never heard about, and um, it does not, it is um, inspired by various pagan, by various modern neo-paganism, triple goddess religions, but it's not a real religion. Also, the people weren't, per, I don't have any sympathies for a religion which killed a lot of its worshippers via a, grueling murderous pilgrimage. Sorry, I didn't like these people. People, I didn't like Sefer Halima. The actress was wonderful. Her name is Tania Miller and she's a British actress and she was great, but I didn't like the character. But still, the Mercil kills her and um, she can't, and that she shouldn't. Of course, she's obviously very highly conflicted about it, but um, it's difficult to explain that she kills her on the order of the empire. And it's difficult to explain that away with the zero's law. law. And later on, she kills who's absolute, the absolutely harmless and probably would have been good for the empire, Brother Dawn, who is an impure clone. I mean, okay, we're just talking spoilers here, so we should maybe put in a warning. Warning, and that's absolutely, she's obviously highly conflicted. She rips off her face afterwards, but it's still, she's a, those, she violates the first law and not in service of the zero's law. And, uh, she also says that she's programmed above all to um, obey the empire. This is not at all in the books. Books uh, she will, she will, uh, Demoiselle will obey the empire in the books, and also is an imperial advisor, but only um, because um, because it helps humanity. And in the books, Demoiselle, of course, also helps to set up the foundation and um, 
Cross and manipulates Harry Seldon into, well, making a bit more than theory of his, of his work. And I hope we will get to see that eventually, but yeah, yeah, the actress was great. I would have liked a bit more adherence to the actual laws. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with a lot of that. Um, you know, the zero floor obviously was a major change just in the robot stories. It's the utilitarian principle of the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, but it was never clearly the case in the zeroth law that it was okay to kill people. I mean, it, it was implied. I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so I agree that, uh, you know, the, the original, you know, our Daniel Oliva, who became Demerzel, would have probably figured out a way to do what needed to be done on behalf of the zeroth law without killing two people. And, and, and that I think is part of the problem. And, and this actually gets back to Joel's point. One of the problems that David Goyer, Goyer encountered, and there was really nothing he could do about it is whatever he did, it, it, it was going to be judged by people who not only read and loved the foundation stories, but chances are, if they love the foundation stories that much, they read the robot stories. In fact, you can't read- They probably read everything Asimov ever wrote, or at least, uh, I mean, he's very, very prolific, not, his, not all of his non, but I think I read pretty much every science fiction thing he ever wrote and uh, wrote and, um, the only, I didn't uh, I didn't read the Black Widows, even though my the bookshop where I bought the books had them, but I was like, oh, it's one of those mystery things. I'm actually sad that I didn't read them because they probably are good, but um, okay, that can't be changed. Or I could be sh change it if I bought them again, but uh, okay. I, I want to read them. Uh, I, and uh, yeah, one of the reasons... Fascinating. Uh, one of the reasons I'm really interested in the Black Widow series is I, I've come to think of Asimov more and more as I've been studying foundation in depth um, as I've been understanding him as a as a great mystery writer he just loves to yeah. uh, hide and misdirect and you know keep you going on the wrong trail and then all he of a sudden uses. like just yeah. blow your mind by turning things over and I think that's one of the things that is Asimovian about the series so far is the, the great reveals and uh, stunning changes that you weren't expecting. Uh, and that's, I, I think that's in the tradition, but I agree with all the stuff about zero law, except that uh, I think we might, one thing I've noticed in the series so far is that a lot of things that seem to not make sense get explained later. Uh, and I think we might see some of that with some of these like very violent things that Demersel's done uh, in explaining how what her reasonings were and that it might be based on zero flaw. I also think that maybe we'll get they'll get the rights to the robot series at some point, and that could change things a lot as they start really introducing some of those ideas. And they're I probably going to have to see. <laughs> would love to yeah. see uh, Daniel Daniel Olivaf and um, Elia Bailey um, Bunny Cop series. Take Laura Byrne, please. I mean, she's, she's great. she already plays the role. She's great. It really doesn't matter. And I simply would love to see the scene, which is already hilarious in the original, where Elijah tries to explain that no, knowing the laws does not mean justice and uses a biblical example. You can, they can even talk about religion, which they seem to love to do. And he uses a biblical example of Jesus, Jesus and the adulteress. And, um, and uh, Daniel is always, okay, what is adultery? And what is stoning? And Elia is clearly very embarrassed to explain the whole concept. And now imagine that if Daniel were a woman and it would be even more hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that would definitely uh, add an important element to Asimov's uh, original robot stories. By the way, before I forget, I have just one other, you know, not the most profound explanation for why Demersel killed Dawn in that scene. You, you, uh, what was also going on in that scene is dusk and day were almost, they were coming to physical blows, right? And she's witnessing this. And, you know, her point that she has to keep empire together, she, it, it was a correct decision that by snapping Dawn's neck, she would stop the fight cold 
between dusk and day. Uh, had she Maybe not- she should have just, uh, I don't know, snapped, uh, snapped the neck of dusk. I mean, dusk is an awful person. Yeah, this yeah. Dusk, not the previous <laughs> dusk. The actor is great, but the dusk is awful. He's terrible. So day is, is uh, well, still a galactic pilot. Oh, um, are you hearing me? Um, I have a, a thought on that. He's um, sort of frozen. Yeah, it's okay now, but I'm froze. This is Harry Selden. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a thought. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I have a thought on the um, the killing of Don too um, that just occurred to me is that uh, perhaps Demerzel doesn't see Don as fully human uh, because there's a backup, you know, that can be re- restored at any time, uh, and. Apparently, they have the memories updated constantly. So in a way, it's like a, a, a very a hurtful experience, but the, in a, it's almost like the, the person that gets killed just wakes up and goes on. So yeah. maybe she sees it differently in that case. Uh, and the, also, the, the, but that the other explain, one... That doesn't explain why she, yeah, why she killed the priestess. So with, with, with Halima, this is a little harder, but... My thinking is uh, maybe it's uh, that there, there's a scene in uh, The Naked Sun. Uh, remember uh, how the murder was done? It was, yeah. it, was, it was actually performed by a robot, or not by a robot, but by a human using a part of a robot. A robot. Uh, wow. that's, yeah, there's, yeah, spoiler, spoilers. Uh, but it, in a way, it's kind of analogous in that she was being used as a weapon by someone else, right? And her programming was such that she it was stronger for her to, would have been harder for her to resist it than to follow through with it. And so, but you would expect her to suffer much more. And most of the time in, in uh, Asimov's stories, when a robot did something in violation of the first law or any of the laws, but especially the first law, they would get roadblocked and get all confused and like a stroke victim. Right. Yeah, the robot in the Naked Sun pretty much goes uh, goes mad and is barely yeah. pretty much barely possible to even interrogate the robot because um, he is mm-hmm. so. At first, they think it's just the robot is disturbed because he had to witness the murder until they figure out um, the poor robot was a murder weapon. Yeah, yeah, and this is why that's such brilliant mystery writing because how I mean the whole story of the Naked Sun is how could a robot kill someone in violation of the first law well the answer is you you know disconnect disassemble the robot and kill you know the person with the robot's arm and you know this is asimov's brains as a mystery writer i i just want to also underline something that that joel said one of the things that i really loved especially in the last few episodes is it was not obviously specifically what asimov we're having wrote. some freezing problems again yeah okay uh, there we go. All right, good. One of the things that I really uh, loved, uh, which Joel mentioned in the uh, at least the last two episodes, and it was not specifically Asmo's content, but it was Asmo's general style of putting in a twist, and then before you observed and realized what was going on, another twist came in, and and the scenes in episode nine when you know dawn is confronted by himself and and then uh you know the the people you know come in and you know within like a literally a 30 second period of time three or four different vectors of stories intersect and this i thought was actually the, the most Asimovian in many ways, that approach to storytelling. And, and as, as Joel well knows, we see this over and over again. So, you know, in, in the story, you know, in, in the hunt for the second foundation and who is the mule, what Asimov does is he presents one option after another, you know, even later on, you know, the, the explanation that's satisfied, no, it's the explanation that's true. And I think that David Goyer did capture that really brilliantly in the story. Uh, Let's talk about Harry Seldon. And um, first of all, I agree with what Cora said, and I don't know anyone who said otherwise, that Jared Harris is a brilliant uh, actor. Um, By the way, his father, 
uh, as some people don't know, his father was Richard Harris, who himself was a, a great actor. Not only that, he and, and Joel might be aware of this, he had a huge hit record called MacArthur Park. MacArthur Park is melting. In yeah. the park, right? And yeah. so, uh, so Jared Harris comes from a great family. I first noticed him in Mad Men, where he- I did, think uh, all of us first noticed him there. <laughs> yeah, and he, uh, he really ate up the show. And, uh, you know, and he came in at a point where some people were getting tired of the other characters. So I think he did. A, I think the acting was fabulous. Uh, but let's talk about Harry's story and in specific, the fact that he is killed in the series, uh, how he comes back. Uh, what's going on with, what are there, two AI programs that Harry Seldon, you know, one, one is on the ship uh, that, that uh, Gail gets so furious with him, and, you know, the other is obviously on, on Terminus, uh, and, and then in some ways most significant, I think, and I think I like this change, but I'm wondering what the two of you think is, obviously Harry Seldon in the novels is just a recording, a holographic recording that he did, you know, years, centuries earlier. Here in the television series, he's an active AI program that can have a conversation and hear what people are saying and give clever, sarcastic answers. Uh, is that a good or a bad uh, change in Harry Seldon? Well, I, I love the new uh, I, I, Harry, because he's um, he's still Harry Seldon. He's very, very smart, like, oh, everything happened just like I thought it would. Wonderful. Well, he's still smart. He, um, he, uh, he ans doesn't really answer. He answers your questions on occasion, but he doesn't really answer them. You know, he, well, I mean, it's kind of nice that he actually tells him, okay, well, how can you get rid of the empire now? Because normally you say, oh, the solution is very obvious. You know what it is. And then in the books, it's the first story, it's actually Salva Harvey says, oh, yes, he's right. The solution is obvious. <laughs> obvious. So, yes, he's, but he's still the kind of, uh, well, he has this kindly grandfather image, but he's also, and he is, a, I mean, he is a grandfather in both the series and the books, which is interesting since um, the series didn't seem to go there at first. And I'm also not still how, sure how I like that bit. But he's a, he's a kindly grandfather character, character also, and also, um, also this absolutely infuriating. I'm uh, infuriating. I'm not going to. I'm. Go I know everything, but don't think I'm going to tell you hologram. And yeah, I, I really like like Selden, and also like that we got more of Harry Selden than we would have gotten in the books, where he's basically only shows up at the, at the climax, climax as a hologram to tell everybody what was what just happened. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything Cora just said. Uh, he, he's amazing. Uh, it's a great performance. Well, well written. Uh, and, uh, and to me, that's the only flaw in the books is there's not enough Harry Seldon. Uh, yeah, I wanted more of him all the time I was reading it. I was like, where is, is he? He isn't going to come back at the end of The Merchant Princes? Come on. What's going on? Yeah, that uh, was the, that was the, <laughs> I actually, I, had, I reread that one last year for the Retro Hugos, and I was like, where's Harry? Why is there no Harry? Hey, I want my Harry hologram. He's supposed to show up <laughs> and tell everybody that Homer Mellow is right, and then... Because I've completely forgotten that he wasn't. Also, I started with Prelude, which actually is all Harry. I was always disappointed when we didn't get enough Harry later on. Yeah. Yeah, but I just want to say, as long as we're talking about Harry, I've noticed that I like it. Uh, and I don't know if you noticed this, Cora, that Joel pronounces Harry Hari, like Hari Krishna. You know, I thought like I was <laughs> listening to a George Harrison song. Uh, so, but, it, but in a way that... That's appropriate because there is almost a religious <laughs> yeah. aspect to Harry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a few of them. Kind of a cult, <laughs> even though they, they say they're not, but they kind of are. <laughs> yeah, I still call them. I uh, still call Ga Gal Dornick, not Gail. Uh, it's just yeah. how it how it started in my head. I can't get it out of there. It's like comes out the same way. The show. Yeah. I, no, I won't let the show redefine the way they're they're pronounced. Good, you shouldn't. But actually, you're right. I, I mean, at least I 
pronounced her name that way reading the books. Gal, it didn't seem like yeah, Gal. Me too. <laughs> me too. But it was, I, here I'll give uh, Goya credit or whoever came up with this idea. It was clever taking a name that was spelled that way and, not, and basically making it a woman uh, called Gal, which is a feminine name. Uh, which, by the way, I think is much better than, again, not to take another shot at Star Trek, which I also love, but now the main character in Star Trek is Michael, a, a woman. I, I don't know why they do that. I mean, it's like, you I know, think it, it was uh, it was a tick of the original showrunner who's been replaced like three times. I also do episode by episode reviews normally of Star Trek Discovery. I'm not sure if I'm going to do this season because I can't legally watch it watch it so uh, I can of course watch it we all know how this works but um, <laughs> but I'm not sure if I'm going to do it but uh, I think it was the original showrunner where to sing about women with men's names but uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of the whole concept I mean she's Michael so fine but um, also because in Germany actually um, if someone has an ambiguous first name then you have to add a second name name um, which makes it clear what the gender is is so um, <laughs> so Michael as a as a Michael as a girl's name would not be would probably not be approved or you would have to call her something like Michael Elizabeth or whatever. Right, that's a good point. By the way, let me mention to our viewers and listeners that Cora is in Germany right now. Joel is in California. I'm in New York. So we don't have like a totally global uh, conversation going on here, but it's pretty good. You know, we have it's across the United States and uh, in the center of Europe. And uh, let me also mention, uh, I, was, I was thinking about this before we started our podcast, in terms of my relationship to Isaac Asimov, one of the things that I managed to do with Isaac Asimov, and we had several different things going on. I, I published a book in 1982 called In Pursuit of Truth. It's a collection of essays. Uh, I was just editor and I wrote one of the essays. People contributed essays on the philosophy of Karl Popper, who was an Austrian philosopher who then went to England. So what does this have to do with Germany? I decided to have two people write prefaces to the book because there were so many different issues in the book. One was Isaac Asimov, who, who wrote a preface for it. And I remember I had a conversation with my publisher. I said, how much money should we offer him? You know, like $1,000 or something? And, my, and the publisher said, no, Isaac Asimov will do anything as long as you give him some small amount of money. Offer him $100. So I was like embarrassed to offer it to him. Yeah. But, but Isaac said, sure, I'll do it, absolutely. <laughs> The other preface, though, was written by Helmut Schmidt, who was chancellor of West oh, Germany. Oh, uh, Helmut, our chancellor, yes. That's uh, right. He, was, he would have still been chancellor then. He, uh, stepped, oh, that... he stepped down on, uh, uh, wait a minute, it uh, was September 6, 1982. That's that right. was, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, the book was published in 1982. So I think. Yeah, so he would still have been chancellor at the time, yeah. but uh, it was on his way out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So he, he decided to lift himself up and write a preface to this book better than being chancellor. But so I've always, you know, had, had, a, had a good feeling about, uh, you know, the connection between Asimov and, and Germany just because of, of those, those two prefaces. Um, Let's talk uh, uh, about something else in the uh, in this first uh, season of, of this uh, what is going to be and I, and I certainly hope Apple does continue it for for eight seasons and um, and I think this is something I mentioned to Joel online and by the way let me just tell our viewers and listeners that uh, Joel Core and I are continuously talking about. Uh, foundation on Twitter. So I will in the show notes put in our Twitter handles and you can feel free to, to come in. Uh, I always thought that the first book in the Foundation trilogy, which as I'm sure most people know was not even written as a novel. It, it, it was a series of stories that were originally published in Astounding Magazine. Th thanks, Cora. And, and then Asimov collected them and wrote a new first uh, chapter. That to me, although it was excellent, was the weakest of the three uh, novels in the trilogy. Uh, and, and again, it's not so much a shot against that first novel, it's that the second novel, I mean, to me, the, the apex of the trilogy was the general yeah. 
stories and the mule stories and then when the mule comes in that's uh that's yeah, a, okay. and then there's a second from here also the first story then i mean they only adapted the first two stories of this first book okay. so the 1951 preface which was basically the first episode and pretty much close to the first episode except for the major terrorist attack attack because <laughs> nothing so interesting happens in the the real book it's basically just the travel local oh look Look, uh, here's uh, Trantor. Isn't Trantor beautiful? Oh, here's Harry Seldon and Gail Dornick, which is also why Gail, Gail is a walking, talking info dump in the book and uh, a cipher, even more of a... Salva Hanen has a personality, even though um, Salva, we never get a description. We don't know. We only know that he uses male pronouns in the books. That's all we know. And that he smokes cigars. Cigars, but... Uh, and he's... He's described as the broad figure of Salvor yes, Hardin. He's a broad figure. He's, he's a broad figure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Leah Harvey is not a broad figure, figure, but uh -huh. it really doesn't matter. And Gail is Gail has no character at all. Gail is a mathematician from Synax, and uh, which is a backwater planet, planet who comes to Trantor, does a bit of touristy walking around, and then accidentally gets blasted and exiled, exiled. And um, he's a, Gail is an info dump. So. I really don't mind making Gail a more interesting person simply because, or also Salva. The first story, Foundation, is also, it's probably, it's the weakest story in the first book, book because the, the, the stories they adapted are really the weakest ones because in Foundation really, let's say everything that happens is people sit around and talk and talk and they're all male, which interestingly, I mean, I read this as a teenage girl, but it didn't bother, bother me. I, I was like, oh, yes, they're all male, but I barely remember this. This is probably because uh, we get, uh, I got Dawes Vernabelli, another interesting robot character, and Harry's wife first, because I started with Prelude. And then, of course, we get uh, Beta Darrell and Arcadia Darrell later on. So there were plenty of good women characters. And um, I don't mind it, but it's a weakest story. It's just people talking talking. We'd still get lots. I mean, we still get, we got some of those characters. Louis Pyren, the head encyclopedist, who um, is still a bit of a jerk in the, the series, but a much better character, but still true to the book. Lord Darwin is another guy who's also a much better character. And oh also, God, so much. The, 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 the actor <laughs> is the husband of Jodie Whittaker, who's currently Doctor Who. So yes, Lord Darwin is married to the Doctor. Which is uh, interesting. Science fiction royalty. <laughs> that is interesting. Wow. Yeah, I I have to say a word about Dorwin. I I absolutely loved Lord Dorwin in the books. Uh, and like you're saying, all it was was talking. So at least Lord Dorwin had a speech impediment. You know, it's, it was interesting. So um, and I loved playing him. <laughs> he was so much <laughs> fun to play. And uh, the other thing that's missing from the series, and I kind of expected it's it's fine, but um, I have, I just really enjoy the charm of all the tobacco usage in uh, the, the series. Yeah, we won't get Which, the tobacco anymore. We won't no. get in, in science fiction yeah. anymore. I was, I, was, I was missing Lord Dorwin's snuff box. I, I really wanted that to make an appearance, but unfortunately, no. Yeah, he could um, have pulled it out and um, done something yeah. with it. But okay, <laughs> when, we are missing the tobacco use. Uh, use. Also, um, I actually liked the... Uh, Anacreon um, representative in the book is a guy called Anselm Haut Roderick, who's very, yes. very arrogant and a self slight aristocrat. And uh, I, I liked him because he's a pompous idiot. Idiot. Farah isn't is an interesting, but Farah is basically she's an insane fanatic. The actress seems didn't she, she reply to Joel, I think, or was it the, the other album, the other, other the stars and podcast? She seems to be a lovely person, but um, Farah is an unlikable fanatic. Sorry, I just can't. She simply, I don't like her at all. Sorry, she's, she's, I was glad actually when she was gone because Far is just a terrible person. There's no shade on the actress who's actually very good at playing this terrible woman. I actually <laughs> really liked Farah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I'm with Cora. I couldn't, I couldn't stand her. She had, she, had a, she had a really foul disposition. She was arrogant. Uh, not that I enjoy seeing people killed, but uh, I was happy to see her get an arrow in in the neck. I mean, that was like the best best thing for her. Uh, but but you know, as far as Goyer is concerned, so in terms of what we're just saying, uh, not that Goyer needs our approval or or anyone's approval, but but in a way, 
given the weak material that he had to work with, uh, he, you know, that should uh, result in him getting more credit for putting on such a good first season. And uh, on the other hand, when, when we get to the general and the mule, he better deliver because yeah. <laughs> if he somehow loses track there and puts in irrelevant things and change things, I, I'm going to recommend Joel's radio play of the mule that people listen to that rather than watch uh by the way joel's in terms of his voices he, joel does the mule i mean he's, he's really uh good um i did i did hire somebody to be beta which was yeah. a good idea i think uh, uh, yeah he was uh, no, it's hard. It's hard. right you could have this could have, enough men and azimov where we can uh, we can if there's if there actually is a woman it should probably be a female voice <laughs> yes I, I i actually did do uh lysia the Comdora. Uh, yeah, okay. Merchant but she's not and really. That, yeah. She's not really. One, <laughs> no, and she was just such a stereotype, and it was yeah. it was pretty easy to do her. But uh, that's the one that taught me. No, I need to get a woman for beta. I can't, I can't no. do it myself. No, it and she has too many lines. You know, she's too dominant in that story. To, the Comdora is of doing. course the only woman with a name with a speaking line with lines and a name in the first. There's only two women in the first women in the first book. One is a non-talking servant girl who gets to model Glowy Eulery, which my teenage self was like, "Oh my God, this is so amazing! I want one of those things." Okay, maybe not with a nuclear reactor. I mean, I read this shortly after Chernobyl, which had a wonderful film adaptation starring none other than Janet Harris. Uh, Harris. And um, so, of course, nuclear power was, oh my God, all those poor people are going to die of radiation. And I'm glad that they got, they had to get rid of the nuclear power angle, which is really important in books, books simply because um, that wouldn't fly anymore. More. And of course, they do have technological issues, issues, um, issues, um, especially Anacreon has uh, apparently no metal and almost no metal and no real technology. Um, Cespis seems to be a bit, a bit better off, so they have the technology issues. Issues. I want the one thing I missed, but maybe we get this in season two when they do brittle and settle. The second story is a uh, is a fake religion, which is, which was a thing I just loved in the books that the, the foundation tricks them with the tricks the aggressive neighbors and subjugates them via a fake religion called scientism, where where they give them, oh, we give you all this cool technology. We are wonderful people, but uh, it's actually magic, our, our, our technology, and you need priests. And, but we will train priests, no problem. <laughs> and, and it's, but we may get that because the character who is a high priest actually shows up in the first season as one of those cutesy kids who run around. He's, po he's poorly, very soft, and he's a foundation high priest in Brittle and Saddle. So maybe we will get that one. One. Yeah, so I, 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 because um, well, Salva is. I, I'm curious how they're going to manage all these timelines because they now they have Gale and uh, Salvor 138 years in the future, and but they they can't just drop all this stuff that's happening uh, at Empire, can they? Or will they just handle this all in flashback? And uh, like you said with Polly Verisoff, I hope we don't like he's just somebody's great grandfather or something in the next episode. I, I hope that's not the case. Cause I, I really, as soon as I saw him being introduced at the beginning as Polly, I Polly Verisoff, I can't wait that's, uh, to see him grow up and be the, the priest. Yeah. Uh, so I hope it happens. Yeah, I want him as a, I want to see a grown up Polly as a really, as this pompous high priest. I mean, uh, he curses, uh, he curses a ship. <laughs> He causes a battleship, a ship, and then you are basically disabled it via a kill switch, and all the Anakians are, oh my God, so sacred. And then they try to shoot, uh, then they try to shoot Salva, and uh, it doesn't work obviously because he has one of those. And I love that they have those pause fields, those pause, even if only the Empire has them right now. Now, so yes, uh, yeah. So I hope we get to see that simply because it was an, as an angle I loved at sixteen after having some run-ins, which is probably why I loved it with. Uh, with um, I was raised Lutheran and um, and also also still went to church on occasion at the time and had run in with very hypocritical people who claimed to be very Christian. So yes, of course I lapped that stuff up. <laughs> I think same thing with me. Yeah. yeah. 
the same kind of questions were occurring to me as a 15 year old and that book was just uh, just delicious for those reasons yeah i have to say i mean mo most of us have read the uh, series more than once i i read it uh, when i was 12 years old and loved it i then read it when I was in college, because I was taking a science fiction course and I wrote like my final paper on it. Uh, and then I read just the trilogy one more time. Um, and at that point, it was it had begun to expand uh, into the uh, sequels and prequels when my son was about 12 years old and, and we would walk around the block and talk about it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what my grandsons, you know, think of it. I mean, and, and the series has that much staying power. Uh, j just a couple of uh, concluding uh, thoughts, uh, just a couple of points I, I, I'd like to mention. On this question of empire, what's going to happen, uh, you know, to the, to the dawn, day, dusk configuration? Uh, just to remind viewers who've seen the series, we don't know now the status of dusk. Right, because I think the guy who basically breaks it today that he has been tampered with, and like first he says, you may have been tampered with, but then he says, you've been tampered with. My take on that mm -hmm. is he knows he's been tampered with. He's afraid to say today that he's been tampered with. So day definitely has been tampered with his DNA. I would predict that Dusk has been tampered with also. We'll see that, but that will then change the nature of the whole clonal thing and i think we'll be seeing these characters even though in again in the novels in the series obviously the you know the the emperor becomes much less important uh you know as the story goes on to the point where the emperor is almost non-existent i don't think that's going to quite happen in the uh uh series uh, and then the other point i just want to make is um in all, well, actually two points. One, I just want to get in here that according to Asimov, he, he, he makes a point of saying this in a very prominent way in his uh, autobiographies, and he wrote a bunch of them. He, he says that it was John Campbell who came up with the ideas for moving the series forward. That Campbell said, you know, about the general, why, why don't you uh, have a situation where, you know, the foundation manages to overcome, you know, the best general in, in, in the uh, empire. And then after Asimov wrote that, he, he goes back to Campbell and he, they're sitting in Campbell's messy office, even messier than mine. And uh, Campbell, according to Asimov, says, all right, now write a story about there's some kind of mutation that arises that Selden couldn't have possibly thought about. So I don't I never talked to Asimov about that particular point, but uh, I can't imagine that Asimov would basically uh, take credit away from himself. So I think we can probably assume that Campbell uh, does this. It matches that. what we, we know about Campbell. I mean, I uh, don't know if, if you has read it, I know you've read it. Alec Nevala Lee's wonderful book, Astounding, Astounding about the history of Astounding Science Fiction Magazine and Campbell, Asimov, Heinlein, and Elron Hubbard, which is, yes, it should have won the Hugo, and I'm still furious that it didn't that it didn't win because it was simply the I best think. book on the ballot it was a, it's an amazing book book if you haven't read it read it buy it buy it it tell also tell you and um he confirms that as he, that um campbell gave his writers prompts and also if you look a lot of those themes which show up in foundation show up elsewhere the future history heinlein has this the fake religion gaza darkness by fritz leiber and also well manipulating religion is a uh, is um, by is um, less darkness falls, which are also absolutely loved at 16. It's so wonderful for uh, for stop the stupid Christians from ruining the wonderful Roman Empire. Empire, I learned Latin, so of course I love the Roman Empire. Even though my ancestors kicked them out of northern Germany <laughs> many years ago. So yeah, the battle at the Teutoburg Forest, which didn't happen, the Teutoburg Forest happened like maybe uh, well 100 kilometers south of me. So yes, it might have been my ancestors who were involved. <laughs> involved so but I loved it um, it's there uh, the mutant angle there's um did he uh, I try to remember no, I don't think they published I don't think Sl I'm not sure if Slan was in the uh, was Slan in astounding probably I'm not sure really now but um um the, the Wilma the children of the atom by Wilma Shires which is basically the X-Men years before the X-Men X-Men was um in astounding so 
those were common themes and probably different variations of Brom's Campbell just throughout. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I just wanted to, uh, a defense of Asimov, he's often criticized for not giving women prominent roles. He's actually criticized for like two related things, not giving women prominent roles and there's no sex in his stories. So um, um, <laughs> there is no sex in, there's almost no sex in, in anything that uh, John, John Campbell and Kate Talent, his assistant editor, who apparently was the person who had issues with, uh, mm. who, did, who cut out all the rude content. But I mean, uh, Hober Mallow has, go, likes fun bicing in the news with a male friend, Lame Tour or whatever his name is, and uh, they smoke cigars, of course they do, and put them in each other's mouth, and okay, that one is very, very Freudian. It's not, it, I can't imagine it's a cigar. And, it was hilarious reading that again as an adult and finally realizing what it meant. <laughs> well, that's a very good um, point. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, can I say something about the uh, the women thing? Uh, uh, in my fourth episode, The Traders, I, I talked about this uh, about his uh, issues with women because there was also the the accusations of uh, groping yeah. uh, at his uh, and which were pretty well known. He was known as the man with a hundred hands, I think, uh, but. I wondered about the the why there were no women, and I thought, uh, um, you know, is he just anti you know, anti women in some in some way, or just had issues, major issues? But when I read his um, autobiography, I was really kind of pleased to see his explanation for why he didn't have women in his first stories, and he said it was because uh, it, that women in pulp sci-fi at the time were always damsels in distress. Uh, and he just didn't want to clutter the story with that. And, and he couldn't, he didn't want to just repeat the trope that was common and he didn't have any other ideas on how to use women in his uh, stories. I mean, he created so, Susan Calvin around those, uh, even right. Susan, I see, yeah, Susan, P, P, actually Susan came before Foundation. Uh, yeah. yeah. Foundation. <laughs> Susan Calvin, Liar came, I mean, Susan and Liar is not the Susan we later get. I, Susan Calvin was a character I loved. She was exactly what my teenage self needed. He was a cool woman who didn't care about make up boys and all those, all those uninteresting things who did science and created robots. And uh, he's a great character. Another one I really would love to see uh, to see on TV. Maybe the Susan Calvin, Mike Donovan and Gregory Powell show, Powell solve mm. robot problems show. That's another one I would love to see. See, uh, at least a woman who did, what's her name? Bridget Monaghan or whatever her name is. She was also in Blue Blood. The woman who did Susan Calvin in the in the Will Smith film was pretty good, actually. She was a good Susan, Susan, even if she had the wrong eye color. The only thing we ever learn about Susan is her eye color. <laughs> well, her, 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 eye, her eyes were blue, I think. Her eyes were blue in- Yeah, uh, they were the color of liquid nitrogen. Oh, and uh, that really, that was, I went to my chemistry teacher and said, okay, what's the color, what does liquid nitrogen look like? And she said like, it's white and actually you can't really see it because it's, because it turns into vapor, and I thought, okay, like so, very, very light blue. And uh, Bridget Monan is a very attractive woman, she's probably a bit too attractive for Susan, but um, but she's uh, but she's dark eyed. Did she yeah. have thin lips? <laughs> That's what I always remember about yeah. Susan that she had thin lips. Yeah. Not not exactly like a voluptuous kind of uh, yeah, description. Yeah, uh, no. I, I the. I would say Beta Darrell, I don't know who in the whole foundation, uh, not only the trilogy, but the series, I don't know who could be considered a greater hero, maybe Harry, than, than, than Beta, you know, in terms You're of- You're freezing uh, up, Paul. Okay. Yeah, we're having okay. a meeting. <laughs> uh, uh, how about now? Better? Yeah, yeah, um, that, that's too bad because yeah. you froze there and I really wanted to hear what you said about Beta uh, Darrell. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. I don't, I don't know who could be considered a, a greater hero in the Foundation saga than Beta Daryl, you know, in, in you know, that, that scene, uh, which again, Joel and Axe so, so beautifully. I mean, that was unbelievable. And, you know, with her husband there not understanding exactly what's going on, and she explains it, it was not only heroic, it was brilliant, uh, you know, on, on her part. And she saved the foundation she saved humanity in that yeah. one act. I, 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 I was reacting. Beta, the mule would have won. Without I, I was reacting. 
uh, to uh, a lot of uh, what I'd been hearing online and like on on podcasts and things about Beta as like not that great a character, and and, and I wanted to bring out what I thought was great about Beta in that, in, and I really like worked at, and and in, I think Amanda, the the actress that played her, did it too. I, you know, she did a great job, so I'm yeah. really thankful for her contribution. She did a really good job. All right, let, let's wrap this up. And uh, I hope uh, you, our viewers and listeners, enjoyed this conversation. Uh, with any luck, uh, we'll do this again next year after the second season and see where things have uh, developed. Uh, how about a final uh, comment from Cora and Joel? And then we'll say adios here. Cora? Okay, well, um, I also hope that we'll get to see a um, great next season this, next year, and we'll get to see Brittle and Saddle or um, the Mayors, as the story is uh, known in the book. Uh, book, And, uh, well, I hope they will at least go through the original trilogy. I don't need, necessarily need Edge and Earth, Foundation Earth, which I, Foundation Earth is the only one I don't like. <laughs> and... Um, and yes, uh, otherwise, um, yes, if you want to read my in-depth foundation reviews, uh, reviews, you can do so at uh, www.corabulat.com, com, where I also review other, um, science, a lot of vintage science fiction, including some of the original Asimov stories and um, other TV shows and whatever comes to mind. Also, um, I'm a two-time Hugo finalist for Best Fan Writer. Right, uh, I would ask you to vote for me, but I can't anymore because voting closed to last Friday. So now I'm sort of Schrödinger's Hugo finalist because we don't, because no one except for the Hugo administrator knows who's won yet. <laughs> yet, and uh, yes, so also you can find my books on wherever ebooks are sold. Good luck with that. Oh, all right. Yeah, very good. Uh, okay, so um, thank you for. I'm honored to be on this uh, chat with you too, because uh, I'm really pleased that one of the things that uh, one of my um, favorite podcasters, uh, Doug Metzger of Literature and History, uh, uh, told me once uh, is you when you get a, a podcast that gets a, a, a listener base, you'll just be uh, so gratified with how many people, the interesting people you meet, and you know the kind of feedback you get. And it's so true. Uh, my life has been transformed by how many the kind of people who have responded to uh, Selden Crisis and and uh, interacted with me in email and on Twitter. Uh, I just love the community that's come up around it, and it's it's wonderful. So I hope that continues. Um, I um, want to second uh, Cora's. Uh, uh, reviews for foundation are just amazing even when i didn't agree with everything i uh, with some things i i just loved the writing quality and the the depth of thought that you put into it uh, so i really appreciate that and i hope everybody um uh, hope you get some more readers out of this uh yeah, and i hope i get some more fun. listeners for selden crisis so come yeah. and listen to selden crisis and, and especially the last three episodes of the mule uh, uh, put a lot of effort into them, and uh, my uh, my son is the video editor uh, and sound design person for that helps me, and he put a lot of work into the sound design. So um, I, I want to give a shout out to him, Jeremy McKinnon, um, and uh, that's about all for me. I think. Looking forward to the next season. Me too. Well, thanks to both of you, and I'll I'll just say to our listeners and viewers, you'll find links to all these. Uh, wonderful podcast and Cora's work uh, on YouTube where the video will be placed. There'll also be an audio version on Light On, Light Through if you want to listen to this when you're driving. Not a good idea to watch a video when you're driving, but listening to audio is good. And um, I, I hope to see uh, the two of you next year uh, here in the United States. This is just two days before Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanks, Joel and Cora, for joining us. Take care, everybody. <laughs>